This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Make and run a website for 10% less moolah by using my link and code in the description. When I was a child, this is how my New York Italian-American father and grandmother made pasta. Cooked pasta on the plate, sauce on top. I naturally thought that's just how it's done. Then when I was a teenager in the 1990s, we got the Food Network, and I saw Chef Mario Batali do this instead. Take it out about 30 seconds to 45 seconds before it's the al dente that you want and cook it in the sauce so the two separate ingredients, the noodle and the sauce, come together as one. Watching Mario Batali do that was the first time I became aware of how significantly Italian food and Italian-American food had diverged in the centuries since impoverished Southern Italians flooded into New York en masse. That wave of immigration included my great-grandfather from Bari, who, as family lore would have it, sailed across the sea clutching a little fig tree from the old country, a fig tree that he then planted in the back of a row house in the Bronx, and it was a tree that I visited many times in the process of visiting my spinster aunts who lived in that house until they died, and my little tree here is a clipping of a clipping of a clipping of that tree. Now, I love Italian-American food culture, and I'm quite glad that it has developed the way that it has. But when I watched Molto Mario as a teenager, I could swear I felt it pinging something in my Jungian collective unconscious, and it sent me walking down a path that I'm still on. Now is as good a time as any to acknowledge that Mario Batali is, at least, guilty of serial sexual harassment, to which he has admitted, and at worst, he's committed sexual assault, which he denies. This is why Batali no longer owns any restaurants and why he is no longer on TV. How should this paint our experience of his old shows? That is a question to which we shall return, but for the moment I want to talk about Molto Mario on its own terms, as the made object that it is, regardless of what its host was doing off camera. Molto Mario debuted in 1996. Batali was 32 years old, and he had hardly done anything in his career yet. He'd apprenticed all over Europe, come back, and opened a small trattoria in New York called Poe, but that was the extent of his empire. The more significant thing he'd done is impress powerful people with his unmatched gift of the gab. I'm going to play you a minute-long clip from a 2004 episode of Molto Mario called Bankers of Torino. We're talking about La Cucina Piemontese. That's right, the cooking from the Piemonte, which if you're familiar with it, is in the far northwest corner of Italy. It's protected by the Alps, although it also has the Alps. So it enjoys a very interesting microclimate, somewhat passed over by many of the cool breezes, but still enjoying a nice cool climate in the fall and a relatively hot Mediterranean-like climate because it's right next to Liguria. It's famous for making beautiful vermouth and a lot of great wine grows in Piemonte, perhaps the most famous of which is Barolo and Barbaresco. Today we're gonna make three dishes, a minestrone, a tagarine, and a beautiful chicken liver dish, all three kind of representing some of the riches and the local products that make regional Italian cooking so delicious. The first step, of course, Mario Batali's logoreic riffing on regional Italian foodways was impressive enough when he was just standing there in his signature orange clogs. But then he would keep at it while simultaneously blasting through at least three dishes in a half-hour show. When the Arabs brought rice and first introduced it to the Sicilian culture in the 8th or 9th century, it was actually cultivated there up until the middle of the 18th century. And what happened, for some reason, and we do not know, is it dried up a little bit in Sicily because when you're... There's at least two different things happening simultaneously in that clip and indeed in Batali's brain. The gabbing part of his brain is going on about historic Sicilian agronomy, while the cooking part of his brain is thinking, oh crap, I'm burning the butter on national TV. Gotta turn the heat down and get the rice in there, stat. With the notable exception of Alton Brown's rebooted Good Eats, there is clearly nothing remotely this erudite on the Food Network anymore. And there's certainly nothing as raw. This genre of cooking program was often referred to somewhat derisively as Stand and Stir, and it was shot like an old-fashioned multi-camera sitcom, more like a stage play than a movie. A set lit up as bright as the surface of the sun, thus enabling cameras to shoot with small apertures and ultra-deep focus. Imagine being a camera operator trying to keep 
keep this whirling dervish inside a shallow focal plane. At least three cameras, I think, simultaneously shooting different angles of the action that unfolds in close to real time. Vitaly would often sprint to the finish with his final dish in the last 10 seconds of the show, while an off-camera producer no doubt frantically tapped the imaginary watch. A touch more cheese and a little bit of toasted breadcrumbs, and there you have it. A beautiful lamb cacio e uova. Thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you. I want to thank you guys for being here, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Molto Mar. Wow, that's Molto beautiful. Friend. A good stand and stir cooking show is to the Food Network as the music video is to MTV. Ancient relics of both institutions' respective original purposes before mission creep led them to trashy reality competition programming, apparently the entropic end stage of all TV. What am I gonna have to do, hire a beaver to chew it? Anyway, perhaps the greatest testament to Batali's ceaselessly spouting well of smart-sounding stuff to say is how little his guests ever spoke. Their job was to sit on the stool and occasionally giggle, despite those stools being perpetually populated by a who's who of New York high society, always introduced with merely their first names. My name's Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Ken, Christy, and Michael, and today we're talking about the basic Pasta sauce primer. Yes, that's freaking Michael Stipe of REM, simply introduced as my friend Michael and almost never heard from or acknowledged again in the ensuing episode. What an epic humble brag for a TV show to do that. I'm here with my good friends Naomi, Jake, and Maggie. Yes, that's freaking Maggie and Jake Gyllenhaal. Just my friends, Jake and Maggie. Epic humble brag. But in a way, Molto Mario really was humble, in a way that I can see now in retrospect profoundly affected the way that I cook and eat. Batali constantly underlined that most great Italian food is born of poverty, and that's part of why it's so good. What you'll find traditionally in this largely agrarian society is that most often we're just using plain old ordinary water. And that's one of the reasons why when you taste these soups, they're going to be something that are so redolent of just the simple pleasure of exactly what's in it and not this murky broth made with the feet of some other animal. It's Devotees of my work will detect some resonances in that clip. No! Batali constantly underlined that great Italian food is about making the best of what you have where you are. As a result, the best way to cook Italian is often to not cook Italian. The most important ingredient in a beautiful carbonara is guanciale. If you could hand me that there, Brooks. If you can't have trouble finding this, there's a place called Bialese in New York, and probably they ship it. But also, there's a lot of great, really high-quality American bacons around. And just go out and buy one that's in a slab so that you can cut it as thick as you But can. beyond Batali himself, the format of Molto Mario the show necessarily steered it away from the arrogant, presumptuous prescriptivism that I abhor in other cooking shows. Somebody like Gordon Ramsay is constantly going on about the the proper way to cook the most amazing whatever it is, as if there is objectively only one legitimate goal and only one way to get there. Molto Mario rarely traffics in such prescriptivist claptrap because its format is inherently descriptivist. Batali isn't saying, this is the right way to do it, he's merely saying, here's the way they do it in this part of Italy. Take what you will from that information. Does it really make a difference doing it that way instead of in a bowl? Word well, note. this yeah. is the way they do it in Italy, Ken. If we'd like to do it the way you do it at your house, it'll be the Molto Ken show. <laughs> no. For what it's worth, I have tried to embody that same approach in my own work. I would never presume to tell you the proper way to make pasta. I just tell you how I like to make pasta and how I came to discover that that's the way that I like to make and eat it. And in the process, I hope to inspire and empower you to go on your own journey of self-discovery. Indeed, I have come full circle on pasta. I've kind of been loving my sauce on top again lately. I love the heterogeneity. Every bite is a little different because you can dose the sauce onto the noodle yourself in innumerable ways. I hate food where every bite is the same. Likewise, I would never presume to tell you whether you should watch Molto Mario knowing what we know about Mario Batali's personal conduct. I'm not going to be the guy that's going to say, oh, you got to judge the creation and the creator independently, or oh, you got to judge people by the behavior
behavioral and moral standards of their time. You don't gotta do anything other than what is right for you. But for what it's worth, I will now walk you through some of my own thought process on that subject as it pertains to my own habits of consumption. The first thing I will acknowledge is that almost no one is blameless in their personal conduct. Certainly not me, and probably not you. Most of us are quite lucky that we have not as yet come to be defined by the worst things we ever did instead of the best. On the other hand, if, if there exists a problem of people being too quickly ejected from public life for behavior that is as common as it is harmful, surely that problem is much smaller than the problem of the behavior and the real harm it causes to real people. People commenting on this video that I'm making right now will no doubt debate at length whether Batali's admitted and or alleged sins should render him permanently persona non grata. But let's assume for the sake of argument that they should, that Batali is beyond redemption. The assault allegations could certainly nudge you towards such a conclusion. Let's just assume that for a sec. Should that stop us from enjoying a really great TV show that the guy used to make? Assuming you even want to watch it, maybe you don't, knowing what you know about the guy, but let's just assume for the sake of conversation that you do want to watch it. The question of whether to patronize the wares of a bad person is much easier, I think, after that person is dead. Richard Wagner may have been a proto-Nazi, but he's dead. All his operas are in the public domain, so I'm not going to be financially supporting him and his proto-Nazi agenda if I buy a ticket to go see Das Rheingold. Mario Batali is still alive and therefore still stands to benefit from my consumption of his products. Or maybe not, because Molto Mario is, as far as I can tell, only accessible in these pirated videos on YouTube. Plans to commercially re-release the series were reportedly scuttled after the allegations surfaced in 2017. I'm not sure if he is making money from these vids, though I suppose I'll find out if and when this video of mine is flagged for copyright, despite being exactly the kind of thing the US Congress envisioned when they codified the fair use doctrine. But anyway, it bums me out that most of Molto Mario is, for the moment, lost in the mists of time. It bums me out that the creation must be banished with the creator. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, maybe that's the way that it needs to be, I'm just saying that it bums me out. And it bums me out for all of the other people who worked on that show. Almost nobody is going to watch The Cosby Show ever again, and I understand why. Who wants to watch a convicted rapist sanctimoniously model the role of ideal family man? But Bill Cosby isn't the only person who made this show. For dozens and dozens and dozens of other people, this show is their life's work too. For some retiree out in Queens, being a gaffer on The Cosby Show was the most important thing he ever did in his career, and now that record is expunged. As someone who worked for years as an invisible producer on other people's shows, that bums me out. Maybe the best way to escape this sticky wicket is to not live in the past. What was good about Molto Mario can simply inspire others to make something new and better. It has obviously inspired me, and who cares if the Food Network is a reality trash heap these days if we have things like YouTube? You want a smart cooking show with an ultra gregarious host? Go subscribe to Helen Rennie. Okay, okay, enough about wine. Let's talk about me. Where would your salad dressing be without me, huh? You know, you're right, Mustard. Man, I love her. Or make something of your own that you would want to see in the world, which is exactly what Squarespace can help you do. You don't have to be a trained computer scientist like Helen is in order to make a beautiful, functional website. Squarespace handles all the technicals, allowing you to focus on what you have to say to the world, which is fundamentally what a website is all about. It's your storefront, whether it's a personal portfolio site or a literal store with which you can sell things while Squarespace handles all the credit card stuff. They can even help collect sales tax and shipping fees. The help guides are exhaustive and easy to read. Your account gives you free access to webinars and other human assistance. What are you waiting for? Build a website and show the world what you've got. Squarespace will even host it for you, and you can save 10% on either a site or a domain registration by going to squarespace.com slash ragusia and by using my promo code ragusia. And please, try to stay reasonably civil and sensitive in the comments discussion about this one. Maybe try discussing something less controversial, like whether sauce should be mixed through the pasta or just plopped on top. Actually, come to think of it, that's a fight that could also easily come to blows.